Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Studio Live. Today in this video, we'll be breaking down GarageBand, Cubase 3 and Aurea Pro. We'll be comparing them and I'll be letting you know which one should you consider or maybe which ones should you consider because this isn't going to be your usual traditional versus series. We're not here to put these to the test and come out with one victor and one triumphant DAW, no. Every different DAW has its own strengths and its own challenges, and different creators are going to want different things from their recording software. So that's what we're going to go through in this one. I'm going to go through the five things I love and the five challenges about each one, and then we're going to come around to the end, and I'm going to let you know which door should you consider for your situation. So let's start with the conclusion. I know that's a weird thing to start with, right? But okay, not my complete conclusion, but let's introduce the video with a quick summary in case you just want the high level thoughts and then move on. So if you're brand new to recording music and you have an iPhone or an iPad, you should probably start recording with GarageBand. Yeah, it is free, it is ubiquitous, it has a huge community around it, and it's pretty simple to get started with. So that's where I would start out. Now, if you're someone who has recording experience with GarageBand or other apps, and you're looking for some more advanced features, or you're finding yourself a little limited by GarageBand features, then Cubasis 3 is something that I recommend you consider because it's a bit of a step up in both learning curve and features, and you may find that it's not frustrating with those limitations you may be finding in GarageBand. If you're experienced at recording using, say, your, your desktop DAW, say you're a Logic or a Reaper or a Pro Tools or Studio One user, and you want to jump into the mobile realm, Aurea Pro is probably going to be what's going to appeal to you because it's more like a desktop DAW than the other two. It's a little bit more traditional in its layout. Now, there's a heap more that we're going to talk about. So that's just the primer to get us started. What we're going to dive into now is we're going to take them one by one. We're going to go GarageBand, Aurea Pro, and then uh, into, sorry, GarageBand, Cubasis 3, then Aurea Pro. We're going to talk about the pros and the cons and a little background information so that by the end of this one, in about 30 minutes time, you'll be able to go, right, now I know what they're all about and you can make an informed decision about what's right for you. And it's gonna be different for every person. So again, if you're waiting for the big Pete loves this one and he hates this one, it's simply not gonna happen. These are three very capable DAWs they all do very well. G'day to the folks that we have here live, by the way. If you're watching live, we've got Sion here, Darren, Dana, Luke. We've got Matt, Matthew, Robert, Tom, Scott, uh, Gary, Eddie, Jamspace, Robert, uh, Jade Star. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We will have a Q&A section at the end. So once we get through all of Pete's ranting about these DAWs, then we'll jump in to the Q&A section. But for now, let's get started. And let's talk GarageBand. Let's bring it up here and show it in all of its glory. Here is the glorious GarageBand. Yes, my home away from home, which is GarageBand. This is what it looks like, and here's what it's all about. So, if you're not familiar, GarageBand is, let's go to my notes, GarageBand is a free multi-track DAW, digital audio workstation. It's made by Apple, and it's loosely based on GarageBand on the Mac and on the uh, and a little bit of Logic sprinkled in there because uh, Apple also lo own Logic now, uh, so that's got a little bit of a Logic flavor to it. Has expanded over the years, so uh, from a simple loop and virtual instrument-based sequencer to what we have now, which is a fully fledged portable studio. It allows you to connect up your instruments, connect up your microphones, as well as take advantage of a variety of sounds, loops, auto drummers, and presets. So it's got a lot going for it. It can have a reputation amongst the more experienced producers as being a toy or being something for just beginners. But you know what? If you look under the hood these days, you find yourself a 32-track DAW, 24-bit quality audio, interrupt audio support, AUV3 support. It's actually got a lot of the features that the more expensive and expansive software recording apps also have. So what are my five best features of GarageBand? Well, I've covered one of them already. Uh, and that is that it's free. So here it is, you know, you can create this. So if we look at this song here, I've recorded in some, you know, guitars using the amp sims, all free. I've recorded my bass for free. I've recorded my microphones here and I've recorded, okay, I've used I've used that uh, interrap audio here for that one. But all of these samples are completely free. They're all included. You can get everything done without spending a, a single dollar euro or great British pound or your particular currency of choice. 
So free is good, yeah? When you're starting out, if you've got an iPhone or an iPad, reasonably modern one, even right, right back to iPhone 6S and iPad Air 2, you can run the latest version of GarageBand and run it pretty darn well. That's pretty cool. Second is simplicity. You can see here the layout is very simple. Everything here is where you need it to be. Uh, there's not much going on here that's going to be particularly complicated. Everything's all in one interface and it's almost deliberately simple, yeah? So it's been cut down from some of the features of some of the other platforms so that it's easier to use. Let's give you an example of that. We wanna add a new, new track here. Well, we just go down to the bottom here and we hit the big plus button and then we're presented with this. <laughs> so it's like, I wanna record a microphone, I tap on the big microphone button. I want some strings, I tap on the big strings button. And then as soon as you tap on that, you're in there and you're, you're helped out. It holds your hand, but in a good, in a nurturing way, not holding your hand in a condescending way. It holds your hand in a, a let's get this done together kind of positive way. And because it's made by Apple, it integrates and it works well in the Apple infrastructure. Number three reason for GarageBand is community. Yes, there is a huge community, not only right here on this channel, I know there's a lot of folks here on the channel who do love them some GarageBand, but there's the GarageBand users Facebook group, there's the GarageBand Reddit, subreddit. There's a bunch of different places where you can get support on GarageBand. We're all in this together with the GarageBand thing and a lot of folks, why am I moving that? A lot of folks, uh, undo is your friend. A lot of folks are using GarageBand and helping other people create in GarageBand as well. So that's super cool. Excuse me one moment. Needed, needed a quick cough, uh, make sure my audio levels are back where they were. Uh, let's continue on. Number four. Now, this is the feature. Whenever I've spoken, because I, I did sort of poll the community and listen to what you folks had to say about GarageBand. The one thing that everyone said they love about GarageBand that is lacking in other DAWs is this sucker here, the auto drummer, where we can get ourselves some pretty cool drum sounds at the click of a button. Yeah, our old man Kyle here, he's been rocking his pop rock little butt off for years. We could just tap the auto drummer here and let's just come out and solve this because it's not going to be in there with the rest of my tracks we'll come out here if we solo this we can just get a drum beat oh mickey or so no um so yeah you can get a drum beat going along with whatever you're doing there and you can see you know i've created my own drum beat for this song but if we uh if we turn on these guitars you'll hear that just throwing a drum beat like this on is going to work So the auto drummer, very, very cool feature, highly underrated, especially if like me, you are crappy at programming drums. It can really give you a good quality drum sound. And the last one here is the compatibility of GarageBand. Let's just unsolo those so it doesn't look bad. The compatibility of GarageBand. So I've already talked about it, but you can use GarageBand on your iPhone, on your iPad. You can transfer your projects between the two, and then you can even uh, send it out to a Mac and open it there. You can't send it back from the Mac to the iOS device, but you can send it from iOS to Mac. So it's got a lot of a lot going for it compatibility-wise. It also syncs in perfectly with iCloud Drive, so you can back up all your projects. Everything is ubiquitous in the cloud, uh, and everything works well. So that is the pros of GarageBand. I know, Pete, you're selling ice to the Eskimos here, but what don't you like? What are the challenges when it comes to GarageBand? Well, there are a few, and we'll, we'll cut into those now. So uh, we, we have no master fader. So you, you knew this was coming, yeah? If you've watched the channel before, Master Fader, the lack of it, does make things challenging because there's no way, you can see here, this at the top here, that's just your volume control. That's not gonna help you actually control the master volume of this track. And there's no way to actually set a master volume. So this means you're doing a lot of individual track changes that you need to use. Now there's, there's ways around this. I've shown these before, but there's ways where you can use the FX function there, and then you can throw a master volume on your FX track, and then you can turn it up and down using the EQ. So most things in GarageBand, there's ways around it and there's hacks and workarounds, but yeah, just the, the absence of that master track is a challenge, especially if you're coming from other DAWs that have a master fader. Number two related to this is auto-normalization. What is auto-normalization, Pete? Well, I'm glad you asked. Auto-normalization means that when you export your tracks, what GarageBand will do is it will automatically bring those up to a zero dB max volume. So that might sound good. You might be saying, hey, that's cool. They're helping you out. And look, they are, unless you want to master your track. So if you don't want to master your track, bring it up to zero dB makes sense. It's going to make it as loud as possible without distorting and clipping. The problem is if you then want to put it into a mastering app like Grand Finale or Final Touch on iOS, 
it's not ideal for that. You then need to turn down the input gain to give yourself some headroom to do your mastering. It's not an ideal way to approach this. So that is number two, auto normalization. Number three, you would have seen when we were playing there, is our metering. So <laughs> the metering on this is a little bit wacky. Uh, if we just play back this track and just watch these meters over here on the left. Distance, observing social distancing rules. Relying on remote access software to make the world safe. So it's not actually really telling us anything, is, is it? We don't have a master fader to know if we're clipping our master bus. We don't really even know what's going on on each individual track. You kind of just have to turn things to the level where everything's sounding okay. So there's a lot of, and look, in, in some ways that's better because you're mixing with your ears, not your eyes, yeah. But in many ways, it can be limiting sometimes just not to have some of that metering. And as far as the display goes, a lot of folks get caught up in this one. One question I get asked more than anything in GarageBand is, how do I change these bars up the top here to minutes and seconds? And I say, uh, uh, yeah, you can't. And that does shock a lot of people. And it still shocks me because surely you'd go into settings and you'd go time display, minutes and seconds, and you'd be good to go. No. Speaking of time, we don't have anything like a time stretch feature. So if you've got a sample or if you've got a loop or you've got something, there is no elasticity. There is no way to sort of change it. Now your Apple loops you can do that with because they're designed to do that, but your other loops and your other sounds, you can't do that. So not having the ability to stretch things and change things and also your tempo and your key signature control. So you can set one tempo, you can set one time signature, you can set one key signature and that's it. You want a key change? Well, that's your problem. You've got to manage it yourself uh, manually and use some workarounds and some things. So yeah, that does make it a little bit more challenging than perhaps some of the other DAWs that we use. Last but not least, you knew I was going to go here optimizing performance. Oh, I know I've just triggered a bunch of people. Some people have just turned off the video and stormed off in disgust. But optimizing performance happens when your iPad or iPhone runs out of resources. It's actually a very handy feature, but it seems to pop up at the most inopportune times. So the reason that optimizing performance exists is that it's, it's designed to make sure that you can still play back your project. What it does is it grabs all of these different tracks with all their effects and all their everything, and it merges them down into individual audio files and then when you hit play instead of playing back this isymphonic track with all of its effects it's playing back its own audio file under the hood and then when you go back and change something well then it reverts back to this version it's actually a pretty smart little algorithm but again you can't choose when it pops up you don't have no control over it and it seems to pop up right as you're about to crack in to that amazing guitar solo that you've been working on for the last four hours and then you have to sit there and watch optimizing performance for 10 minutes so that is uh that is great GarageBand in a nutshell. Five features that I love, five features that I think would be better in GarageBand. But all in all, for free, 32 tracks, 24-bit, 44.1 kilohertz audio, you can plug in all your stuff. You can use a myriad of free plugins and effects and loops and samples and instruments. It's a pretty darn good deal. If you're starting out, you literally can't go wrong. Even if you hate it, it didn't cost you anything. So there's no outlay. There's no downside to it. So uh, let me know. Again, we'll get to the Q&A at the end. If you're just joining us, we're going through the three different DAWs. We've just covered GarageBand. We're about to jump into Cubasis. If you've got comments or questions, at the end, we're going to have a Q&A section. So hold on to those questions uh, till the end if you've got anything or throw them in here. If you do have a question, put question in front of it. That will help me find it at the end. Time to switch DAWs. Da, 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 da. We're going to go and we're going to check out Cubasis. Welcome. Welcome to Cubasis and its friendly pastel patterns and colors and designs. This is Cubasis. If you have missed these, by the way, I've done entire series on Cubasis and Aurea Pro. Uh, they're both down in the description as well. So at the end of this one, if one of these takes your fancy and you want to go check it out in more detail, I've got a six video series about Cubasis 3 where I learn how to use it. I record guitars, I record vocals, I create this track and I do the same for Aurea Pro. So there's definitely an option there for you to check that out. But let's jump in, shall we, to the Cubasis 3 section. So what is Cubasis? Well, it's this. <laughs> 
It's a full-featured multi-track DAW. It's made by Steinberg, makers of a range of audio gear, um, especially audio interfaces, and also the makers of the desktop recording software Cubase. So again, we've got another bit of software that's based on a desktop version, but the difference is Cubase's is very much mobile optimized, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, it has a previous version called Cubasis 2, which is slightly cheaper and less modern, and also a free version called Cubasis LE. So if you own a specific Steinberg or a bit of Yamaha gear, Yamaha are the parent company of Steinberg, then you will uh, probably get a copy for free of Cubasis LE. Now, the Cubasis 3 retails for around 50 US dollar bucks, so that'll be different in your different uh, equivalent around the world. So it is not a free DAW. It's going to set you back some coin. Is it worth it? That's what we'll be talking about. And it was launched at the start of 2020. And for full disclosure, it had some bugs and stability issues early on. A lot of users were reporting that they upgraded from two to three and they were met with a bunch of challenges and problems. However, in my experience with the latest upgrade, the latest version that I've been trying, and we're here in August 2020, uh, I haven't experienced any of those problems that I read about before I started out. So that is Cubasis 3. This is Cubasis 3. Let's zoom in and take a look at it in all of its glory. So you can see the layout here is it's all in one kind of design. We've got our arrangement window here. You've got all of your different menu options down the left hand side, all of your different ability to edit things here, transport controls at the top. And then you've got three sections up here. You've got your media window there. You've got your keyboard window and you've got your mixer window. So it's actually a pretty neat and tight and innovative design because everything is always there. Nothing's really cluttering up. You don't have windows on top of windows and everything seems to work well and come together nicely. So what are my five favorite features uh, in Cubasis 3? Well, number one is, and I didn't talk about this in detail in uh, GarageBand, excuse me. <coughs> I didn't talk about this in detail in GarageBand, but GarageBand automation can only automate volume. The good thing about something like Cubases is if we come here to the automation section, we can actually come in here and we can automate anything we like. So we've got this automation editor and look down the side here. We've got volume, pan, mute. We've got send effects. We've got all of the different things that we have on that track. We can actually add automation to. Now the automation window itself takes a little bit of getting used to, especially if like me, you're used to your GarageBand simple interface, but it is super powerful. You want to create some cool auto panning effect that goes on throughout your track. You can come in here and throw some panning on there. You can also ride your faders. So you can write in automation, which is something you can't do. You have to actually tap in your automation in GarageBand. So there's a heap of automation options here under the hood that are going to help get you up and running. So that is my number one thing here in uh, Cubase's 3 is the automation options are super cool. Number two, not only do we have some cool insert effects. So insert effects are effects that you put right here on your track, right? So you can see here, this is this bass track. If we come in here to the insert effects, we can say, go in here to the channel strip and we can start playing around with the channel strip and add some effects in there with the channel strip. But we also have this one. We also have these send effects and you can see, you can add reverb, delay, any effect you like. You set up the effect and then you can send each track to that effect and then add in different amounts of the effects. So send effects, and having sends and receives can be super handy. And GarageBand does it a bit with the master effects, but this just gives you ultimate control to be able to send and receive through different effects. Now, while it's up here, we'll talk about this because the number three thing that I love, and I really do adore this here in, in Cubasis, is this, the channel strip. So what we have over here is we have a filter, we have a noise gate, we have a compressor, and we have a saturator. And this is all right here in our channel strip. One moment. This is all right here in the channel strip. It's all accessible and it's on every track if you want it to be. It just means you don't have to reach for a separate noise gate, compressor and saturation plugin every time you're trying to mix. Just like a mixing console, you've got the ability to add that right in here to every track. And it gets better than that because not only do we have that one, that version there, but if we come to our mixer and we go to our master track, we also have, uh, if I can remember how to do it, <laughs> this is going to be embarrassing if I can't. There it is. I did make it Excel. That's another cool feature, by the way. You can make your, your faders small, medium, or extra large. So if you make that extra large, we can come in here. And we've also got the master strip, which is this one. You got it. Not only does Cubasis 3 give you a master fader, it gives you a mastering plugin with a multiband compressor, a stereo imager, and a loudness maximizer built right in 
from the word go. So that's pretty darn cool. If you don't want to go to all the effort of exporting your song and mastering it separately, you've got your mix sounding good, your final mix is great, but you're like, oh, I could just use a little bit of compression around about that range and just a little bit of loudness to bring up the overall uh, sound, a bit of limiting, you can do that right here on your mix. And I found that super duper handy. So there you go, channel strip and master strip. Very cool. Now I showed this in the demo that I did, but the chime stretching abilities that we have here are so cool. So you can come in here, you see we've got this stretch option. You can actually time stretch things. So you can make them match up to the beat. You can make them move and you can change the timing without changing the pitch. You can also shift pitch and do other funky things as well. But the ability, you can see here, these are 100%. We can actually time stretch these out to make them uh, different. And there you go. So you can see I can move these out so that we can actually make them different. Let's just solo this track and I'll, uh, I'll play it just to give you a quick example here. So let's bring it back to 100% where it started from. Um, oops, <laughs> now I'm just moving that. Uh, this one, uh, as, you, as you can see, I'm still getting used to a lot of these uh, applications. Um, okay, I'm not quite at 100%, but here's what it sounds like originally. Up to the sky above and you see what if I wanted to slow this track down? Well, no problem. I just grab that and then... Sky above and you see the... Yeah, so again, it, it's not going to sound perfect because you're adding in samples when you're stretching things out, but especially for drum loops and other things, it's just a quick and simple way to access that and do your time stretching. Uh, I better undo that and I'll come back in here and be like, why on earth did I do that? That was a weird move. Uh, lots of levels of undo you can see there. I just wanted to show you the undo feature. Uh, number five. Now, uh, this is the last one, is that it really is optimized for your iPad and your iPhone. So you can use Cubase 3 on your iPhone, which is pretty ridiculous because the sort of plugins that you have here on your, uh, the sort of features you have on Cubases, all of them translate over to your iPhone as well. So you pay once and you get basically two versions of the app. You can use it on your iPad and your iPhone. So that is super cool. And you can see here just the layout and the design of this. Everything is designed for the touch screen. So everything works well and pops up nicely up here and you know you can touch your faders and move them up and down everything just looks and feels you can see there it jumps to each different track so as you as you touch on the fader here it jumps to that track and that brings it into view I'm not touching the top section but you can see it highlights that so you can clearly see I'm working on track three there it is I'm using track three here that's what I love about this is that it's really compact, really efficient design. And it's not taken, whilst the learning curve was a bit steeper, it hasn't take, taken me a super long time to get used to a lot of these features. So uh, there you are, the five features. What have I found challenging? Well, if you've watched the series, you saw me struggle and sort of trip over a few things here. But what have I been finding most challenging? Well, the number one thing is, to be honest, it's the arrangement and have, not having sections. So one thing I didn't mention about GarageBand that I love is that you can actually add different sections and it means you can chop up your track, chop up your project and move things around easily and, and really segment out your arrangement process. I haven't found a good way to replicate this. We have the, the looping function up here. So this is handy. You can, do, uh, you can do looping. So you can record if you're trying to record a guitar solo or something like that. You can do that again and again. But just having sections in there where we can go, here's intro verse, chorus verse, being able to do that would be something. And maybe it's there. Maybe I just haven't explored it enough yet to find it. Number two, the virtual instruments and loops that we have in here. Now, uh, we're spoiled for choice with GarageBand. But there's just not as many. Now, keep in mind, you can use all your GarageBand sounds. So there's nothing stopping you using a GarageBand loop, exporting it, bringing it in here, and then time stretching it out to your heart's content. It works really well. So you can, and because GarageBand's free, you've still got access to all of those free loops and samples. So it's not a deal breaker. But yeah, the, the drum loops, the MIDI files, the instruments that we have in here are all good. Uh, but there's not, they're not the range and the, the, the vastness. Remember, you've got Alchemy Synth in GarageBand. You've got just massive back, back bucket loads of synth sounds that you can use in GarageBand. Not quite the same here. But don't forget, you know, with audio units and with interapp audio, you can bring in a bunch of additional stuff anyway. So it's not a deal breaker by any stretch. But yeah, when you're used to having everything at your fingertips, it's a little bit different. We'll have a quick drink and then we'll be on to number three. <coughs> Lots to talk about. Uh, number three is the learning curve. I did touch on this briefly, but it is going to, there's going to be a learning curve with anything that you use, GarageBand included. The learning curve on Cubasis is what I call a medium. 
So it took me probably 48 hours and then it sort of clicked. It went, aha. And look, I didn't read the manual. I didn't watch many reviews. I kind of just dived in, dove in. I kind of jumped in and just worked on it. So the learning curve will take you a little while. But once you get there, it does really become second nature. Everything just sort of works after you get used to where everything is and how everything is in this one. Number four, iCloud integration. So whilst it has some really cool features and some options in here in terms of how you manage your media, it's definitely a lot better at managing loops and samples and things than a lot of other apps. But because it doesn't save directly into iCloud Drive, because it's not that whole Apple integration, it is a little bit clunkier. So I've found that trying to sort of send projects between my devices isn't as easy. Now, when I say isn't as easy, it's still pretty simple. You save it out there, it zips it up, you send it over, you open it, you're good to go. But compared to iCloud Drive in GarageBand, where you can literally just close the project, put your iPhone down, open your iPad, tap download, tap that project, and it will open the latest version. Yeah, that's pretty darn cool. So we don't quite have that here in the files arrangement here for Cubasis, but again, it's still pretty darn cool. Number five is our track presets. So I say this because, again, if you're used to using something like GarageBand and you come in here to Cubasis, you may find yourself a little bit stuck. Like like I showed with GarageBand before, you want to add a guitar, you tap a big plus button and then you hit guitar. You come in here to Cubases and we hit the add button for a new track and you're like, <coughs> excuse me, you're like, oh, do I need an audio track or a MIDI track or a track group? Uh, let me see, I'm, I'm recording a guitar or a microphone, I'll go audio track. Uh, oh, there it is. Um, okay, what do I set up here? Do I, do, do I have any effects on here at all? Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. So yeah, uh, when you're first starting out, you need to get used to it. You need to then go, okay, so what do I need? I'll come in here to my effects. I'll, I'll, I'll go to my channel strip. Uh, do I need to add anything there? And again, you can set up templates and you can set up presets and you can work through this. But again, it doesn't hold your hand quite in the same way. So when you're starting out, it can be a bit daunting because you don't automatically have things like compression and EQ, reverb, delay. They're, they're there, but you need to go in and find them. So again, it's more like you're using a more professional because it is a more professional bit of software. It's going to require you to do a little bit more work under the hood to actually get things going on. So there it is. But at the end of the day, you can record yourself some cool sounds. Let's just take a listen to this project. When you open your eyes up to the sky above and you see the world, there is nothing. So it's pretty easy. Like I got this together in just a couple of days and, and you know, adding the effects and doing the backing vocals was actually a pleasure to queue up and record the guitars and to record the vocal sounds. Everything just worked well. Just hit the record button and go for it. So there is Cubasis 3. What do you reckon? Uh, is it worth your $50 bucks of hard earned? Uh, or is it something that uh, you're going to take a pass on for now? We'll, uh, we'll soon find out. Uh, well, you'll soon find out. And uh, yeah, let me know if you do have any any comments or other things that you want to say about that. But the time has come to move on to the final countdown, and that is going to be, whoop, we're going to be over here. Whoa, pop. In the one of my life, all the Not only did it open, it decided to start playing immediately. So we'll turn that volume down. Um, that, that may be a little glimpse into some of the things we'll talk about here. So let's, uh, let's zoom this one on down. Here is Aurea Pro. This is it in all its glory. We'll just zoom it in so it looks all nice for the screenshot. Smile, Aurea Pro. There you go. So there is Aurea Pro. Um, now, let's, let's give the, uh, sorry, I've, I've lost my notes here. Let's go to the description because we'll cover off what is Aurea, Aurea Pro. Aurea Pro is a full-featured DAW modeled around a desktop DAW experience, which makes it an easy transition for those who have used doors like Pro Tools, Studio One, Reaper, anything on your Mac or your PC. Um, but it can have a steeper learning curve uh, coming from mobile devices. So, so if you're a GarageBand user or a Cubasis user, it's going to feel a little different and you're going to be a bit uncomfortable for a few days. If your experience is anything like mine, you may be a little bit uncomfortable. However, the trade-off is it is super powerful. The options out the wazoo on this one. It's got a full mixing desk. Let's show you that. This always makes people go, ooh. Yeah, it either makes you go, ooh, or it makes you go, ah, oh, it's terrifying. I don't know what's going on. Uh, so you've got your full mixing desk there. Uh, you've got your, your full arrangement window here. Uh, and you can. it's well suited for mixing giant projects. You would have seen there we've got this ability to zoom all the way in, all the way out. So if you've got projects with a bunch of different tracks and a bunch of different tracks, 
works here, you can really run those projects well. So it's it's, it's high end, it's professional. Uh, it does come in a cut down version, uh, simply called Aurea, which will be around your thirty dollars US, and the full version of this one, Aurea Pro, will set you back fifty dollars. By the way, thank you to the folks over, the folks at Aurea, and the folks at uh, at Steinberg who have provided uh, copies of these for this review. I do like to make sure you know that upfront that those uh, those people have been kind enough to come to the party and give me these copies to test out so that I can show you what they're all about. Best features. What are the best features of Aurea Pro? What have I been liking using? And can I remember where all these things are? Because it's been a few days since I've been using them. Let's jump in and take a look. Um, similar to Cubase's, if we come in here to the effects, this is a channel strip, but like this is a channel strip that's like, uh, yeah, been working out. But this is a channel strip with guns. It's been pumping iron for, for several weeks and it's really jacked because we've got an expander here. We've got a full EQ and we've got a complete compressor with all of our attack release ratio and makeup game control. So again, if you are brand new to recording, you will look at this and probably have a mild anxiety attack because there's a lot going on here and you need to know what you're doing to start dialing in these settings. But as soon as you've spend a little time in the manual or a little time playing around, you'll realize that this thing is ridiculous in terms of how powerful it is. It's on every track. You don't have to touch any plugins. You don't have to add anything third party. You come in here, you set a track, you've got this ridiculous channel strip ready to go. And then of course you can add in additional plugins here in your inline here. And there's uh, access to all of your audio unit plugins, all of your uh, interrupt audio plugins. You've got everything there ready to go that you can add in. You can see here I'm using the Stark plugin for my amp sim and it's just right there. And everything here, you can see, this is what I mean by that desktop feel. See how everything's like floating windows? That's not a really common thing in the iOS world. This is a more of a common thing in your desktop DAW. So that is your channel strip. Now, uh, one thing you can't do, there's a problem here at the moment where if you're using a mouse, it won't let your X out there. You have to use your finger, which is a little bit of a pain, but that's all right. Um, the deep levels of options. So we mentioned that it had a desktop door feel. So if we select a track here, you can see not only do we have the ability to do everything here on the side. So over here, you've got all your track settings over this part. You've got all of your editing section across the top here, but then you'll notice you've got these menus. So yeah, this is where the desktop thing comes in. You've got a menu, you've got edit, you've got processing. So you can actually do different things. They will be context sensitive. So depending what you're selecting, you'll get different options. So they're the options for an audio track, for instance. If we come down here to, do we have a MIDI track on here? Yeah, have got some MIDI tracks. We come down to a MIDI track. You can see they've got different processing options depending on which track you're actually selecting. So that can be, again, really cool. It's a lot of features, it's a lot going on, but it means you can basically do anything. Like the sky's the limit when it comes to Aurea Pro. You can tame this sucker. It's a bit, if you use Reaper on the PC, it's like that. The reason I love Reaper is you can do anything. The reason that I'm challenged by Reaper is you can do anything, right? You got all those limits, unlimited options can be a little bit daunting at times. Number three, the metering. So this has the best metering and the best metering options of any DAW I've used, especially when you come in here to this mixer window. So this is where the action really kicks into high gear. So if we just, if we do bring that volume back up and we hit play on this one. I've done some weird things to this track. I've been playing around with it all week and now it sounds really weird. Excuse me. Now it sounds very, very strange. Uh, but you can see here that when you're playing it back, you've got this metering and it's got great amounts of detail here. You can see exactly what's going on with each of your different tracks on each of your different um, faders here and your buses. And you've even got your master bus down here. So again, like we've said on the other ones, if we, uh, with Cubasis, if we play again. Is it too loud? A little bit. Bring your master fader down. You can see exactly where you're hitting on the meter there. So your metering with Aurea Pro is for the win. If you like to have control, you like to know what you're doing and what your meters are doing, Aurea Pro is where you want to be at. Uh, where are we? The mixer window. I've mentioned it briefly and I've been in there a lot, but it is so powerful. Like when you're recording, it really does feel like you're using an either like an old four track recorder, if you're old school like me, or a mixing console or something, because you set your tracks to record. Look at that, you get those blinking record lights. And the same thing up here, like everything's blinking at you, which you know, can be weird at first, but if you've used software like this or hardware before, you'll know blinking red light 
means you're going to record. You can set your inputs here nice and easily. Input one, input two, ready to record. And then you've got all of your controls here, your aux sends, your panning, and your fader there. And I can't do it here because I'm displaying. But if you turn it sideways, these faders become really long faders. You want super duper control over the precise sound and the precise dB levels of all your tracks. You can get that with Aurea Pro. And there's a heap of different options that you can see in here. You've even got like nice metering up here. You can see your disk usage and your CPU usage. And again, that is something that uh, mobile DAWs don't usually do. That's why I keep saying it's a bit like a desktop one. Now, the final thing here, and this is one I didn't mention with GarageBand, but the problem with GarageBand is that uh, when you've done a bunch of work, if it crashes, you lose everything. So everything, there is no auto save. Everything you do, you need to exit out. That will save your project. And then you go back in. If you've done an hour's work, and then you go in and you get a bug and GarageBand crashes, guess what? You are SOL, which as we know means sort of out of luck. Whereas Aurea Pro is constantly, because it's got this uh, desktop door feel, it's constantly saving projects in the background. You've got heaps of saved versions. If it crashes, and it will, then you can actually come back and recover your work. You're not gonna lose hours of recording and mixing because your DAW crashes. That's the good, that's plenty of it, as you can see. What is challenging? Now, I've alluded to it just then. It's stability. So you would have noticed when I was playing back, every time I kind of went to the top of the screen, it would kind of glitch out a little bit. So let's just hit play. Oh, no tracks to record now. So I'm still recording. All right, we'll not record. If we hit play on this. Oh, hang on. See, again, what have I done here? Uh, I've still got the record light flucking. Okay, I've got to hit stop. All right, as you can tell, I'm still learning. All right, so we're playing. How it is I got here and if I'm going under all the complications of my life. All the so you can see there that because you're going to the top of the screen, it's 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 thinking you're about to do something else with with your iPhone or iPad, or your iPad in this case, then yeah, it's it's not actually getting there. So that can be a challenge and sometimes you'll get glitchy audio that is going to be caused by this. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. The learning curve on this one is, is, is pretty steep. Like, let, let's cut to the chase. It's pretty steep. And it, it needs to be. If you want to do the sort of in-depth stuff that you have the availability to do here in Aurea Pro, it's going to take you some time to get used to it. The very fact that we have all of these menu options that simply don't exist in other DAWs means if you want to use them, you have to learn how to. But here's the good news. If you want to use it like I did as just a recording station, it's pretty easy to get up and running to add a track and then to get recording. You just go menu, you go add track, you go, yeah, I want one track. It adds it. You come down here, you go to your mixer, you come over to that new track, you hit the record light and it starts blinking and then you start recording. So it's not actually that hard to get started with, but it's it's like one of those, it's like uh, Holden Poker. Easy to learn, takes a lifetime to master. So I think I could spend a lifetime with Aurea Pro and never use all the features or master everything. And that's okay because it means they're there if and when you need them. And that's a good thing if you want that level of depth. Uh, adding new tracks, <laughs> you would have seen there. And I don't know why I've, I've got such a problem with this, but every other DAW I've used has had a little plus button down here that I just tap on that and boom, it adds a new track. For whatever reason, I get really confused having to come in a menu and then halfway down the menu option is add track. It doesn't seem an intuitive place to add tracks. Now, when you go in there, it's really cool because you can add multiple tracks, you can import tracks, you can do a bunch of things, MIDI, mono, stereo. It works really well. The problem is I would just love something. All of the buttons we have here, why not an add track button? I think that would just make the interface so much easier for someone like me coming from other DAWs. But again, as I keep saying, this isn't really for people coming from another touch-based DAW. It's more of that desktop feel. Number four is the buffer settings. Now, I'll say the buffer settings, but the settings in general, again, it's when, when you, you know the hand holding thing that I was saying before? Yeah, no one's holding your hand here now. So if you're having issues like I was with the playback, you do need to come in here and learn that you need to come to your settings and you need to adjust your buffer size. So the buffer size, you need to turn this down when you're recording so that you're not getting glitching and then turn it up when you're mixing so that you can play back all your sounds. So there, there is some things to know to be able to do that. You also need to do things like cleaning up your project to make sure that it doesn't keep a bunch of stuff and you maintain that stability within your project. So there is more to remember to do. But again, it's a trade-off, isn't it? 
do you want to do more with your software? It's going to do more. It's going to require more maintenance. It's like a car. You buy a Maserati, you need to do some pretty specialized maintenance on that sucker and probably uh, work a little bit harder and go to a specialist garage. If you buy a Toyota Camry, well, then you can pretty much go anywhere and they're going to have some spare parts for it. That was a really bad analogy, but hopefully you get what I'm, get what I'm saying. And finally, I've talked about it a lot, but the desktop interface here, it is not designed specifically for touch, in my opinion. You can use it, obviously it's a touch interface, so I'm using a mouse here, but you can still tap around and you can still move things around, you can still do things with your finger. But again, if you're using it, and the reason is, because the other thing is, this is not available on iPhone. This is an iPad only app. So it's not, unlike GarageBand and Cubasis 3, it is not a universal app. So keep that in mind as well. But it really couldn't be because I can't see how you would have these sort of menus and this sort of uh, this sort of display on your iPhone and actually make it usable. I'm here on the 11 inch iPad Pro and it is usable, but yeah, even with my chunky fingers, it can get a little bit challenging at times. So uh, yeah, consider that. I, I probably wouldn't, rec if you're on an iPad mini, I probably wouldn't recommend it because there's a lot going on. I don't think your screen size would be big enough for that. A 12.9 inch, you'll be rocking it. You'll be absolutely fine. So there you go. That is Aurea Pro in a nutshell too. So we are nearing the end of our comparisons here. We've been through GarageBand. Let's bring them up. <laughs> We've been through GarageBand. We've looked at that one. We've told you the pros and cons of there. We've jumped over to Cubasis 3. We've done the same thing there. We've looked at what's good and what's challenging for me. And we've looked at Aurea Pro. Give you that summary again. GarageBand. Let's come back over here. GarageBand is 100% free, made by Apple, available on your iPhone and your iPad. Cubasis 3 comes in a few different flavors. Cubasis uh, 2, which is the old version. Cubasis 3, which will be around $50 US. And Cubasis LE, which you'll get for free, a cut-down version if you buy a Steinberg interface. And I do recommend you buy a Steinberg interface because they're very cool. Uh, I talk about them a lot here. Steinberg UR22C is my go-to interface for recording on my iPad and iPhone. Uh, and then Aurea Pro. Aurea uh, Pro, $50 US again, around that mark. About $30 uh, for the Aurea, the cut-down version that has a few less of features. And that is also an option that you can go for. Uh, at the moment here in August 2020, uh, Cubasis 3 is also on sale. So I think it's about 15 or 20% off. So check out the App Store for the details in your local area. Let's come in. So what we're finishing with now is I'm going to give you my conclusion. This is what you've all been waiting for, yeah? I gave you half of it at the start, and I'll give you the second half now, which should not be a surprise to anyone who's watched the series or just been watching this video. And then I'll open it up for Q&A. We'll check in and see if anyone has any questions or anything they would like to add. So get those questions ready if you're here live on Facebook or YouTube. Conclusion, GarageBand is a super capable and will always be my recommendation if you're starting out in recording. If someone comes to me and says, Pete, I want to be a songwriter, I want to be a producer, I want to make beats, I want to create music, and I have an iPad or an iPhone, I will say, download GarageBand and play with it for a few weeks, a few months, a few years. Get yourself used to recording. GarageBand is a great training ground. It will help get you up and running with recording. Uh, Cubasis 3 takes all of the great features of GarageBand iOS and adds to them. So it gives you automation. It gives you a master fader. It gives you a channel strip. It gives you time stretching. It gives you next level features. So if you are hitting that wall, that barrier with GarageBand, and you're like, I love GarageBand, but I would really love to be able to uh, time stretch this beat. I would really love to use panning automation. I would really love to have a channel strip just to make my EQing and my compressing easier on every channel. Cubasis 3 is the direction I would go. Aurea Pro takes you in a different direction emulating more of that desktop door feel. It is super powerful, but with great power, yeah, comes a great learning curve. So it is going to take you longer. However, if you're coming from a digital audio workstation on your Mac or PC or the hardware side of things, I think you're going to love Aurea Pro. I think it's really going to click in with you and you'll probably understand it more than something like GarageBand or Cubasis. So there you go. I did tell you, uh, I did preempt it at the start that this wasn't going to be your usual showdown, your usual versus series where I'm going to come away and saying the winner is because there is no winner. Like everything in music and in life, there is no yes, no, black, white, good, bad. There is what works for you. 
And you know what? If you're using something that's helping you create music and it's, it's something else, we didn't even talk about the alternatives. Core Gadget, Nano Studio, Beat Maker, FL Studio. If you're using those, you're happy and you're making great music, guess what? More power to you. Keep using them. I'm. I, these are all my opinions, my experience. I just wanted to share them because I know many of you are similar to me and many of you would be having similar experiences. And me doing this is hopefully going to help a few of you make the next decision around, do I stick with GarageBand? Do I try something new? What do I do there? Let's come in here and see if anyone has any final questions. Uh, so we've got to, it says we've got to Ellie said uh, why why don't you mention uh, why don't you mention uh, FL Studio? Can TimeScription do every everything which you can do on Cubasis? Yeah, absolutely. There's a heap of different things that you can use, and uh, yeah, absolutely use that. Um, one hundred percent. Scott says uh, if Apple would watch one of Pete's streams to decide which feature to add, it's this one. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure which one it was uh, that I was talking about, but uh, probably, what, Master Fader automation, maybe? <laughs> um, a question here from Darren says, uh, can you use iRig with any of these iOS doors? Yeah, that's a really good point and a really great, great question, Darren. So let's uh, touch on this briefly. Yes, so the hardware side of things is completely independent from the software. So all of your digital audio workstations, pretty everyone that I've come across, will use whatever audio you're plugging into your iPad or iPhone. So if you're using an iRig, it will replace the... So this, sorry, let's go back a step. If you're using just the built-in audio, it'll use your headphone jack or your lightning port uh, as the output, and it'll use the internal mic as your input. If you plug in an iRig, it'll use the iRig as the input and output. If you plug in a two-channel, four-channel, eight-channel audio interface, it'll use that as the input and the output. So whatever you're using is not going to actually be impacting. So that's why when people say, oh, I want to upgrade to a different door because GarageBand can't you know, work with my, my audio interface, I'm like, well, it probably can. If it's class compliant, meaning it can run in iOS, then you can probably plug it in and use it with any DAW. So that's a really good question. And thank you very much for asking it because uh, it's, uh, yeah, it is one thing that you need to keep in mind. Uh, so, uh, GarageBand Guide, shout out to my buddy Patrick over at the GarageBand Guide. It seems neither Aurea or Cubase is a design around touch, really. Cubase has them both been on that front. Yeah, so GarageBand, sorry, GarageBand has them both been. GarageBand definitely, it's, been, it's built from the ground up, right? So, it, it's been built from the early stages. They kind of had a, a really giant head start, and it should be, right? Because it's been around for, for what, seven years, eight years uh, on the iPad, and they've been able to develop it over that time. And Apple have a bit of a free kick here because they've got all of the design and all of the know-how of how the platform works. So if it if it wasn't the best design for the touch interface, then there'd be something seriously wrong. So Cubase is an Oreo because they're not Apple. They have to grapple with learning how to basically put things into the Apple universe and the Apple world. So yeah, a very good point that uh, it, it, it's true. GarageBand has been around longer. It's been there since, the, since, the, since the, the dawn of the iPad pretty much. And it does have very touch enabled, you know, it just feels like you want to touch it, especially, especially when you go to the instruments. I mean, it's a little bit less there, but when you go to your touch instruments and you start like playing the drums, like It's just, it feels like it wants to be tapped and touched, right? And, and the others, they're not quite there. Like, yeah, you got your keyboards, you got your on-screen stuff, but it's not this. You don't play the drums by literally playing the drums. So I think, yeah, 100% right there, Patrick, that GarageBand definitely has it on the touch side of things. Uh, let's see if we got any other questions. I'm just scrolling on up here. Hopefully, uh, the fact that we don't have many questions means that I've covered most of them. Uh, right. Yes, yeah, someone's uh, reminding that, yes, uh, Cubase is 3 is on sale right now, which it is. So, uh, yes, keep that in mind. Um, I think we're actually okay. I think we've covered everything. Uh, yeah. uh, no, sorry, we do, have a, we do have a few more questions. Uh, so, how do, how do the amps uh, on Aurea compare to the ones in GarageBand? Um, I haven't played around with the amps in Aurea much. Aurea, the one thing I didn't mention is that Aurea Pro and Cubasis 3 both have a, a store. So they have a store where you can buy a bunch of different stuff. So what did you ask here? Aurea. So if we go back into Aurea Pro, and we'll bring that one back up on the screen over here. Uh, so yeah, the, I, I've been told that if you do, and this is the other thing to keep in mind, once you bought the original one, you can then come in here and buy a bunch more. So if we come in here, is it in plugins, I think, that the guitar amp sims are in? Uh, maybe not. 
Uh, maybe it's in add-ons. Um, I can't remember. Uh, but there are a bunch in there. So you can actually add in. Uh, yeah, I can't find it. Uh, there's plugins and additional things that you can buy in there that can uh, can ramp it up. Um, I mean, I think the, the GarageBand amp systems are actually really good. I think they're underrated. I think they sound better than a lot. Of, a lot of people don't spend the time to tweak them and to make them sound good. Uh, but of course, in all of these, you can go ahead and use any third-party plugins or apps or software that you choose to do. So... Hopefully that uh, that helps you with that one, my friend. Uh, I did see another one. Uh, did you try? <coughs> Excuse me. Got a wee bit of a cough at the moment. Uh, question: Did you try Cubases with Aurea uh, or Aurea with a keyboard? Yeah, totally. So Gary, if you go back to the series, I plugged in guitar, microphone, and MIDI keyboard with both of them with Cubases and Aurea Pro. So there's videos, there's the whole playlist of the videos down in the description, and you'll be able to quickly and easily find the MIDI ones. They both worked fine. They both worked great with MIDI keyboards, no problem whatsoever. Um, and yeah, which one do I think has the best MIDI features? Yeah, it's 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 tough. Um, it's between Cubasis and Aurea. They both have a heap of options in the, in the MIDI. So I like uh, Cubasis uh, around its quantization options. It's got the nice quantization engine where you can dial it up to keep it a bit humanized. Um, and the editing just seemed a little bit more intuitive. Aurea Pro, I ended up sort of just tapping around and, and not uh, not having as much fun with the editing. So uh, hopefully that helps you. Uh, and a question here from Tom. What are you using for Song Temper, Pete? Have I decided? It's a good question. So I did put a poll. If you're, if you're a viewer here or if you're new to the channel, there is a poll over on my community tab. So let's, let's check the poll, in fact, and we'll do this live and then we will finish up. So I had a poll here from a few days ago and it's still up there. And I said, uh, when recording, uh, sorry, what recording DAW should I use to record my song temper tune? And uh, I don't think you, don't know if you can see that there, but 73% of folks have said GarageBand. There you go. GarageBand. Uh, Cubase 3 came second with 14%. Aurea Pro, 6% other 7%. What a lot of folks have said is, why not use all of them? <laughs> so maybe that will be uh, something that we consider at least trying out. And some people have said, why don't you write it in GarageBand, record it in Cubasis, then mix it in Aurea Pro? And I'm like, oh, that could make life more difficult than it needs to be, but maybe we'll consider that. So that is, uh, that is definitely something to consider. And by the way, if you wanted to know, so I also asked, I also had this question, which was, uh, did you catch my recent videos about other DAWs? If you did, based on which, based on what you saw, which recording app would you choose to record with? And the winner of that one was about the same as the people that said I should use Cubasis. So it was 71% Cubasis 3, 29% Aurea Pro. But it was about 50-50 last night when I went to bed and I got up this morning and all the Cubasis fans have come out and said Cubasis 3. So it's definitely it's definitely a close thing. And I think it all comes down to who you are and what you're looking for and what you want to do, which is what we're going to. Uh, righty dokey, I'm going to finish up here because that is everything we have here. I hope you got some value out of this one. I hope it helped you with your next DAW decisions. Uh, if you're watching on the replay and you want to ask a question or make a comment, drop that down in the comments below as well. And of course, as always, you can head over to studiolivetoday.com. Uh, we have over a thousand videos on the channel now about GarageBand, about mobile recording, and about a whole bunch of things, all designed to help you create, record, and release your best music. Thanks for being here, folks. Uh, have a great week. I'll see you over the weekend on plenty of live shows uh, right here on Studio Live today. Be kind to yourself and to others. Take care, folks.